to you again. Welcome back to part 7 of my talk, um, which is about my time as a national serviceman in the Rhodesian Army, and also my territorial service in the Rhodesian Army. And in my eighth talk, I'll be um, mentioning my time as an instructor in party, the Police Anti-Terrorist Unit. Um, in the last part that you've listened to, part 6, I'd finished a call-up in Mozambique. Um, by that time I'd done that call-up, I'd actually left Victoria Falls with my girlfriend and very sadly uh, at the end of that call up because of the stress that we were both under um, we went our separate ways which was incredibly sad and I've missed it to this day 40 years later but anyway I went back to Salisbury to, to live with my parents and while I was there I got a call up paper to go to back to Victoria Falls of all places um, my application to leave a company 2RR had been accepted by my infantry major and I've been transferred to support company uh, to lead one of the platoons, uh, mortar platoons and anti-tank platoons, which I knew nothing about, but they needed an officer. Um, and now at that point I had two pips, I was a full lieutenant, uh, so I was effectively second in command of support company. Um, my boss was Captain Roy Pritchard, a hell of a nice guy. Um, so when I got my call-up papers, I, I went to Bulawayo by train, caught another train up to Vic Falls. Um, my platoon was driving up from Bulawayo the following day, uh, or even possibly was uh, on the road when I was on the train to Victoria Falls. I got there ahead of them. That gave me an opportunity to walk around the village and go and see where I lived with Marilyn and have a look at the flowers that we planted. It was very sad and very nostalgic. Um, and a bunker that I dug um, was still standing there. Um, I dug it because Victoria Falls had been hammered um, through so many mortar attacks and it was a place of safety that we ran to. So. After doing that little walkabout, I went back to the, the army base for independent company. I introduced myself to the major there. I don't remember his name. It, it was not Don Price or any major that I was familiar with at the time. And um, I introduced myself and he didn't seem to know who I was and why I was there. But I said I'm a, a, company, a support company and I've got some mortars and anti-tank guns on their way up. And anyway, he said, oh, well, okay, um, just grab yourself a sandwich and a cup of tea and go and sit outside and wait for your team to arrive, which they did do uh, at about 3 o'clock that afternoon. And an impressive sight as these five or six vehicles drove into camp. There were the, the usual Unimogs, the Mercedes-Benz two-and-a-half tonners, uh, tough-looking guys with their goggles on and um, emblazoned on the door was um, an artillery shell with wings sticking out the top of it with uh, two RR support company emblazoned underneath it. <clears throat> and these guys had had a lot of um, experience down in the southeast and um, it, it was a privilege to become a commander. Like I said, I knew nothing about mortars and anti-tank guns, but we had a a very, very capable and skilled guy by the name of Johannes, or Johan, I can't remember his surname. But um, when they rolled into camp, I got them lined up, introduced myself to them, told them what I'd done in the area and what was to be expected of them. And then the Major told me that um, I must go up to the back of the Elephant Hills Hotel, which by that time was a ruin, and in my last episode or two in this series you would have heard about how that hotel was burnt down by a wayward SAM-7 missile and um, so it was now a ruin and a perfect place to form um, uh, a camp and, and an observation point over the river into Zambia. 
So that's where we went up, very steep hill going up there, went to the back, cleared out some bush, uh, set up the tents, the, the cooking area with the deep freeze, um, and a tent for myself and one for the, the two sergeants and the other guys just slept under bivvies. And the African soldiers that were with us, about 50 north or so, were used to protect the camp during uh, action, during a punch-up. And so all of the guys um, followed me around and I put them into all-round uh, positions with little shell scrapes. And there, that would be the place to go to in the event that the camp was attacked. The uh, three mortar pits with the 81 millimeter tubes were dug. Ammo pits dug. Um, the ammo was sort of uh, buried, not covered up with sand, but put underground to um, so that, that if a round went into them, it wouldn't blast everybody to pieces. And I had two 60 mil tubes and the two 110 tanks on the back of um, anti tank guns on the back of the Unimogs. It was an idyllic posting. Um, I went back to the casino, met Fred again. It was very nostalgic going in there, but I had a I had a great time. Uh, went on some booze cruises as a Ford Fire Control Officer, which we did in case the booze cruises were um, attacked from Zambia. And um, generally, I slotted back in really well. I met my boss. Um, Roy, he came up, spent the night, we had a few drinks by the swimming pool and chatted and I really, really liked him and I just thank God that I've been transferred from from John to Roy and I really felt at home. Um, I was my own boss, it was an independent unit, I was 2RC of the company and I loved the company commander, he was a great guy. So I was very happy and uh, part of setting up our, our camp um, was to defend the Victoria Falls Bridge. If anybody tried to cross that, it was well within reach of us. And where we were stationed gave us um, uh, an opportunity to fire anywhere within the village area that was surrounded by a minefield roughly six kilometers from the town center, and we could just about reach all the way to the border on, on the east and southeast and to the west um, where, the, where the minefield was. We certainly could to the left, that was only three k's away. Um, I met a girl um, one night and um, I started to get friendly with her, which was nice. Uh, felt like home, having a dance there, having a nice meal. And the next morning, um, nothing happened that night, but the next morning um, we were called, myself and the two sergeants were called hurriedly into the uh, joint operations or subjoc. Um, uh, the Rhodesian army operated from uh, bases called jocks or subjocs, joint operation commands, where the head of the air force, the, the army, the police and so on, would meet and formulate um, and, and coordinate operations within their areas of responsibility. Um, the subjock was based at the SMBC Hotel, a beautiful, very big hotel with a massive thatched roof. I believe it had the biggest thatched roof in Africa, right on the banks of the SMBC, about um, five kilometers west of the village itself. We were called to a meeting. I got there in record time with the two guys, parked my T5. Uh, there was um, a guy on guard duty at the Rondavel that had become the uh, conference room. Um, at the back of the conference room was a Rondavel where a communications center had been set up with radios and all that sort of stuff. And <clears throat> when I went in there, I introduced myself <coughs> and once again, Nobody really seemed to know who I was. I discovered later that I wasn't even put on the operational radio net. Um, but there was a, a brigadier in there, there was a couple of captains. Um, I, and we sat down at the table and we were told something that made our hair stand on end, that the 
there'd been an uplift. I think this terrorist's name was called Sabanda in Botswana, and he mentioned that there was going to be a conventional attack on Rhodesia from Zipra. That's the Joshua and Como troops that were based in Zambia. And, <clears throat> you know, in war you get the, the counterinsurgency, which is the terrorists in the bush, and eventually when it gets really hot and the country gets really subverted, it flips over to the conventional stage, which is tanks and infantry. Well, the switch had been flipped. They were going to make a move on the country because time was running out for them um, to reach a settlement with the Rhodesians. And um, they decided to invade with, we were told, 20,000 men, 10,000 at Chirundu, which is uh, on the river just east of Kariba, on the, on the Zambezi River, and also at Victoria Falls. Their, their plan was to cross at Victoria Falls and <clears throat> capture the airport there um, at Sprayview, and then, I believe, move uh, inland to Wanki, which was 100 k south southeast of us, where they were going to fly in more troops with uh, Cuban, Cuban pilots and large aircraft. And from that point, they were going to move down to Bulawayo, capture Bulawayo, while part of them swung northeast towards Salisbury, and the guys coming in from Chirundu, the north uh, northwest of the country, north northwest, uh, would swing towards Salisbury in the pincer movement. And so we were told this group of 20,000 were ready to come over. And um, the whole of Victoria Falls <coughs> was going to be put on alert. Um, a company of troops from 9RR was uh, brought up to Vic Falls. Um, a whole lot of armored cars arrived, um, and basically, at the where the bridge crossed into Zambia, is on like a spit of land, like um, the neck of a lizard, and where the lizard's no nostrils were is where the bridge crossed the Zambezi River into Zambia, and the plan was that they were going to send troops over in a train, Trojan horse style. They were going to put 1,200. Uh, gooks into the train and shunted across the bridge and disembark and capture Vic Falls and um, they would then <coughs> carry on with their plan of capturing Sprayview, the little airport at Vic Falls, and then moving down to Wanky where they'd capture uh, the Ford Airfield base, the FAF-1 airstrip which was big enough to, to handle bigger transports. Um, there was also an airport at Victoria Falls, which I'm sure they would have used. And so we faced this quandary uh, down at the bridge. The engineers put tons of explosives on the uh, on the pot where the bridge touched the radiation site, and they set up a, a, a remote TV camera facing the bridge so that uh, when this train or a mass of infantry or tanks tried to cross over, they could remotely detonate this charge and bring the whole bridge down, which which would have been a huge economic loss to the country and to Zambia. Now, uh, about 100 yards, 150 meters back from the crossing over into the in, into Zambia, was like um, a, a customs post or something like that. That's where the television was set up. Um, and in front of that, we erected 44-gallon uh, drums behind which our anti-tank guns were ensconced. And then <clears throat> over to the right, which is like where the hair of the, the, the lizard's head would be, on the southern side, um, a very large bunker was dug um, with a, a sort of reinforced roof. And inside that, many machine guns and many riflemen were put into that bunker and a smaller one between there and the customs post and um, also that B-10 anti-tank gun that I participated in intercepting going back to Zambia that was there to be used against them and so we had artillery covering the bridge we had my mortars we had my anti-tank weapons and we had a company of troops we had um, I think I counted about 
15 or 20 armored cars in, in the, the campsite one evening, so we had them as well. They were Eland armored cars, um, Panhard from France, but made under license in South Africa, and they were called Elands. They carried a 90 millimeter gun, which was incredibly powerful. Um, when you consider that um, Tiger tanks in the Second World War had 88 mil guns, these these little noddy cars had 90 mil guns, and I'd seen them in action at Kazangula. Impressive little weapons. And uh, so we had quite a force. Um, I mean, obviously the idea was to blow the bridge, but if they had come across, they they would have been stopped by uh, blockages on the tracks. The, the train would have been derailed. They would have had to disp uh, debus in a massive killing zone. And running alongside left and right of the railway line was um, uh, a tall fence, which the engineers uh, put all sorts of goodies and trip wires and nasty things on it. So if they went any, anywhere near the fence to escape, they would have been blown up and coiled barbed wire on the northern side. So we had them pretty well hemmed in. <coughs> um, once that had all been sorted out, things, you know, went casual for a couple of days. Uh, we were all still on high alert, but I was out chatting this girl up, and this time she invited me home. And I went back to her place, and um, I was just in the bathroom washing my hands and cleaning my teeth and walking into a bedroom when there was a massive, massive series of explosions down in the river area. And my jaw dropped and I, I you know, I picked up my radio and ran downstairs into my truck and I raced back to camp. Um, I almost collided with the anti-tank guns going down to the bridge because they weren't based there all the time. We camouflaged them up behind the um, Elephant Hills Hotel ruins and anyway there were flashes and bangs going on all over the place by the time i got back to the camp um the place had been stood to everybody is ready to go ahead i went into our little ops room with our radios where johan was and um i thought right uh when when are we what's going on you know and uh i could tell that there was massive amount of firing down below us, just west of the Azambezi Hotel. And so I grabbed a radio and walked over to the observation point. And um, what I saw there was, it, it was incredible. It was um, a reasonably good moonlit night and the silver snake of the, the river was coming from my, my left to my right, um, dark over in Zambia, dark on our side. <coughs> But coming across that mirror-like surface were probably 12 to 15 very large dinghies and boats coming across from Zambia. And there were streaks of uh, tracer coming from our side. Our tracer was red. Their tracer was green. Um, a few little flecks came back from from the boats. and, and But then this white light, white tracer opened up from the spit of land on the Zambian side. And that was white, usually indicates it's from an anti-aircraft weapon. So it was, a, I thought it was a 12.7 or 14.5. And uh, it was being aimed at where our little red fireflies were emanating from and uh, seemed to have quite an efficient impact on our guys and our little tracer lights uh, stopped. And then I was calling down to uh, Zero or whatever they were called down there, telling them that we're ready to open fire. What is our mission? And um, I couldn't get through to them. There was just a hell of a lot of noise on the radio, people talking to each other. And then the horizon behind me to my left just flickered like in the movies around El Alamein. And then all of these artillery shells just started coming across. Bang, bang, bang. And uh, the shoreline where these guys were departing from 
was just getting hit by, by large numbers of salvos from our artillery guys up at the up at the the airstrip. And um, I learned subsequently by talking to the commander of the the ambush party down on the Rhodesian side. There were two Eland armoured cars there with about four or five guys from the Grey Scouts um, as support infantry and they had been tonking away at these these um, dinghies coming across. Um, the lead one carried, according to the commander of the armoured car, carried probably about 20 to 30 men. It was a big boat and they fired a 90 mil round into it and it just dissolved. And, and sank into the river and then the other smaller dinghies tried to avoid that point and uh, rode slightly westward and many went down east actually as far as the falls I believe some actually were swept over the falls it was uh, an incredible sight and um, anyway the 12.7 was so effective that the armored cars had to move um, for fear of being opened up like a tin can and um, so they moved out of there and then I, I was getting really pissed off I thought well why is, you know all this artillery all this shooting what the hell is going on so I tried to get through again uh, still still didn't get any um, feedback and other mortars had opened up from somewhere I think the Grey Scouts under Captain Theo Williams had uh, mortars or there were other guys down by the SMBC they were firing over into Zambia and it was a hell of a mess going a lot of flashes going on in Zambia anyway before I could say jack shit the, the bloody contact had ended and I hadn't fired a shot this just seemed to follow me through the whole war I had just experienced the most incredible punch up I was just about to to give orders to open fire um, independently um, I didn't want to do that because I didn't really know who was where did we have special forces over the river what the hell was going on I didn't know and so I, I was just about to say stuff it let's open fire and when it ended so that was that uh, my nerves were janking and we had a few drinks in our pub that night there at the, the, our little base camp by Hunter Falls I woke up and went to bed at about 3 in the morning. It was a surreal experience in the village. Um, fortunately, nobody tried to cross at the bridge. But what we learned from this was that the guys that were trying to cross were two or three hundred of them at least, maybe more, four hundred, were going to come in the back door, cross over the river, and walk along the riverfront and come in behind our defensive forces at the Victoria Falls Bridge and hit them from behind and then send the train over with the 1200 troops in it and um, we thwarted their plans well the next day bodies were being picked up out of the river I believe 30 bodies were picked up uh, we picked up another uh, well the, the guys got on boats on the tourist boats and um, they'd seen men waving at them from an island near the falls and another 20 or 30 um, gooks and the interesting thing was that these guys were dressed in dark brown khaki uniforms with black boots so they were regular soldiers they weren't tours that wore denims or you know whatever thing they could these were proper soldiers and um, so they were picked up off the island uh, and for days afterwards when we went on boost cruises with the tourists it just life just carried on I remember one tourist saying oh look at that hippo look at that hippo over there meanwhile it was a big um, bloated gook um, this woman thought it was a baby hippo but it was a guy all puffed up from the sun and the flies and when she learned what it was <laughs> she let out a bit of a screech um, yeah, so 30 odd bodies were picked up along the river bank. Uh, about another 20 went over the falls. Uh, 25 landed in, in the open minefield, uh, walked into plowshares, they were killed in there. And 25 managed to get onto land west. 
of the minefield and they went up to the Kazangula Road where the Grey Scouts had a contact with them. So the police station where all the bodies were taken was a wash with dead. And uh, Theo Williams told me in in a in a WhatsApp interview once that um, he had heard after the war from uh, a commander, a Zipra commander, um, that dozens and dozens and dozens of these guys waiting to embark into these dinghies had been hit by the artillery and um, that Livingston was awash with bodies. Um, that's what he quoted. He, he actually quoted 200. I, I know for a fact that 80 or 90 were killed in the river. I know that for a fact. So it was a very effective um, defensive action carried out by national servicemen and territorials. But I don't think it was ever mentioned in the press. I don't ever see a report about it. It's, I don't think the artillery logs were even kept. Well, if they are somewhere, nobody knows where they are. It's just something that happened. Um, I have the greatest respect for the special service guys, SAS and all that lot. But, you know, we did quite a lot too, us little national servicemen and territorials. And I thought we would, I would just uh, bring the story up for you to enjoy. Um, in my next talk, um, I actually stood down from the army altogether after this because uh, I continued with my job at Sable Chemicals and I became um, an essential worker working in a fertilizer factory because the farmers needed fertilizer. And so I left the army altogether. <clears throat> But when I eventually went back to Salisbury, having resigned from there, I had no work. And so I'd met another girl by that point in time, and we were due to get married. In fact, we did get married. Her name was Diane. And when I was with her back in Salisbury, I had no job. And so I thought, well, I'll join the police as an instructor. And uh, that's what I did. I became a regular in the police a regular, got the rank of section officer, which miffed me a bit because I was an officer in the army and I, I expected inspector's rank, but they said stay for a section officer for a year and if you do okay, we'll put your rank up. And so my next talk uh, will be on my experiences as a police instructor and what happened with Indira Gandhi. So thank you very much for listening and I hope you enjoyed this episode. Thank you.